<laughs> Hello and welcome to Calculus 1, Section 311 on Related Rates. Might be my favorite lecture, not sure yet, I, probably my favorite, my favorite lecture, there you go. I just made a decision. My favorite lecture of Calc 1, Related Rates. These are 100% word problems and we are going to use improper, not improper intervals, ah, implicit differentiation, there we go, implicit differentiation to solve problems. Now, the key phrase over here, the title, related rates. The word rates has um, the derivative coded in, so if I have dy dx, that's a rate, of y changing with x, right? So now, let's uh, take a look at the basic idea over here. I am going to take an ice cube, let's say, and leave it in, uh, in a sun, and let's pretend that this ice cube is going to melt perfectly, always keeping the shape of a cube, right? Like they all do. So, you have a side A, it's a cube, so all sides are A, and you can write the volume formula for it as A cubed. Now, as you leave the ice cube outside in the sun, let's say, it will, the time will pass, right? And as the time passes, the ice cube melts little by little. Now, as ice cube melts, volume decreases, right? And the length of the side decreases, the surface area decreases, the diagonal of the cube or diagonals of each of the sides decrease as well. Everything decreases. As the ice cube melts, a lot of these components decrease. In engineering, there are certain components that you can measure uh, easily, and then the others that you actually need, you get to compute. Now, melting ice cube, okay, fine, you, you can put the ice cube on a tray and then collect all of the water, right? You can have a little channel or something that will collect all of the water into a beaker and then you can actually read the amount of volume that the ice cube lost over time. So yes, you can, you can measure it that way. But it's much easier if you just measure the side and um, if you measure the side you can compute how much volume you lost over time. Yes? Wouldn't the side also be more accurate because as it melted the water would get more dense or less dense eh. well it's the water so it, it doesn't really not to the point that would bother us probably would bother very precise chemistry but not for a practical application I think yeah anyway so what am I going to do now I am going to take this formula and I am going to differentiate this formula in respect to time because I want to learn about the change of volume in time. So the derivative of V is 1 and then we have to follow, remember the, uh, integra the derivatives, right, the implicit differentiation. We have to follow dv dt. Well, let's write one. Okay, the derivative of, of v is one, and then follow by dv dt because you took the derivative of v in respect to t. It which one goes first. Equals two. Yeah. And then we have three a squared, and then I took the derivative of a in respect to t. So now we can get rid of this one in front, and. What you have here is what we call related rates. You have rates, 
plural, right? Rates. Rate number one, rate number two. And they are related with this, which is the rest of the equation. So that's literally your title, related rates. And now we want to understand these. So this one is rate of change of volume in time. And this one is what? Rate of change. Nope. Of side. length of the side. in time. We know that the higher temperature will melt ice faster. So, if you put the ice cube on the sun and you have to wait 15 minutes to melt, well, maybe you can get it in 15 seconds if you have a blowtorch right pointed at the ice cube. Right? So clearly, the rate measures how fast things change. And that is the goal of the entire section. How fast is the volume changing? How fast is the uh, distance changing? How fast is the area changing? Right? All of these ideas now kick in. So now, what can I measure? I can measure that the length of the side of the ice cube is one inch. I can measure that I lost one sixteenth of an inch in a minute. Those are rates. You plug them in and you calculate the rate of change of volume, which is how fast or how much volume we are losing for this. Now, obviously, this is a really, you know, simple example. Uh, not nothing, nothing much going to it, right? But let's take a look at something that it's you know more applied. Something that's more fun. Well, definitely not fun. No, no, not fun, not fun. What we are going to have here is the oil rig. And um, there's going to be an issue. So when it starts leaking oil, hashtag <laughs> BP, um, <laughs> we're going to see that the pollution is going to spread in these concentric circles the longer you wait the more is the more of the ocean is polluted by the oil leak now the cool stuff is that well huh, cool stuff uh, the the fact is that the oil will actually float on the sur close to the surface of the ocean so we can actually scoop it up now, what is happening in this case? Well, we have the radius that is growing in time because the longer you wait, you don't plug in the, the leak uh, right away or, you know, the longer you wait, the more oil will spill and then the larger the radius of disaster. And um, what we care about here is the area and the growth of this area because remember when you dispatch cleanup crew they have to clean up the area and the longer you wait the more area there is so now if i want to consider this problem it will say an oil ring springs a leak in calm seas and the oil spreads in a circular patch around the rig if the radius of the oil patch increases at the rate of 30 meters per hour. So, oil spreads at the rate of 30 meters per hour. How fast um, is so how fast is the area growing 
when r equals 100 meters guys 100 meters is 50 times my height right so imagine 15 15 50 of me right and uh, that's going to be the radius around the rig and it's growing so now what yeah, it's terrifying right 50 <laughs> so we are going to now uh, solve this problem right and before you freak out oh it's a word problem i'm going to ask you to tell me what geometry are we using in this problem are we talking about square triangle cube pyramid right what is the geometry of the problem circle thank you circle because we are talking about circle now what quality of the circle right are we talking about area of the circle circumference of the circle we're talking about area and radius exactly so i should immediately write the formula which we all have memorized for area of the circle because i have to take the derivative of this in time all of your derivatives in this section will be in terms of time guys because you are measuring how fast ch things change and whatever the concept is that you are measuring it will always change with time so all of the derivatives will be ddt in 311 all of them so now when i take the derivative what's the derivative of a one and then da dt right equals to uh, pi is a constant what's the derivative of r squared 2r so 2 pi r and then dr dt because we have to follow with the chain always remember your um, implicit differentiation every time you take the derivative with the mismatching dimensions in this case r and t r is distance t is time they are not the same concept you always have to follow with the chain what you have here is related rates now you did the geometry right so you're, you're done with geometry you are done with modeling you have the formula that will compute the problem now we need to plug in the numbers it says oil spreads at the rate of 30 meters per hour what is that 30 meters per hour yes great i have two rates which one uh, the rdt the rdt why is it the rdt that's correct yeah how do you know it just says oil spreads at the rate of 30 meters per hour never said the radius of it is the radius but how do you know it's the rdt because it's in meters if it was the area would be a meter square excellent yes length has a unit that it's not squared area has meters squared inches squared feet squared areas are squared volume is cubed so you will know in the word problem you will know in a word problem when you look at the units physics 101 so 30 meters per hour is going to be the rdt because meters is length awesome and then when r equals 100 meters that's that's not a right so now they say how fast is the area changing well that's the adt right did we all agree that the rate and then when you do it in terms of time it's how fast so you're changing area in time so that's the ADT equals to 2 pi r is 100 and um, the other one is 30 for a total of 2 times 3 is 6 three zeros and then a pi at the end for the 6000 pi meters 
squared per hour. So meters squared per hour. Guys, pi is roughly three. So you are talking about 18,000 square meters. 18,000 square meters. Whew. Growing quickly, actually, because they are going to, to clean this per meter squared or a kilometer squared. And um, that's also estimating the cost, right? Because you have to clean this up. Otherwise, there will be protests. Cool. Let's see what else we can do. Ooh. This is awesome. This over here is the airport. So you have one airplane approaching from this side, one airplane approaching from this side. And now there is so this distance is measured as x this distance is measured as y that that's just math right and then there is the distance d in between the two planes we definitely don't want them in the same location at the same time right right, right thank you okay good so what are we interested in where we are interested, well, first of all, let's just use some, some uh, analysis and, and, and common sense before we actually do any math. Um, wh what is happening as these, these airplanes are going towards? You, you can see that the top airplane is, is moving right to the, to the left, and the, uh, the uh, bottom airplane is going up, so do north. So, what can you tell me about capital D, distance between the planes as these planes move? It's constantly changing. It's constantly changing in which sense, which way? Getting smaller. Getting smaller, very good. So, as this plane is moving and this plane is moving, the distance between them is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and we do not want that distance to be zero. The question is, at what rate is this distance decreasing? That is the question of the problem, right? So this distance is going to decrease faster as the airplanes fly faster. That should be common sense, right? We can do the experiment now with three students over here, right? One student is going to be airplane, uh, airport, two students are going to be airplane. If they walk slowly, the distance between the two students that are acting airplanes is gonna be not gonna be that much, right? But then, if they run towards the the airport, clearly it's gonna decrease much faster. So we can compute the rate. Now, that rate, right, tells us right about the impending collision. So we want to know that um, that the they say near miss not a near miss collision is a near miss all right think about it anyway well that's just foreigner thinking i mean <laughs> near miss they nearly missed anyway <laughs> A near hit anyway uh, <laughs> let's go and talk about the uh, let's talk about this so now what do I have right I have things that that airplane can give me as an information the airplane can give me the distance they are from the airport 
and they can tell me the speed at which they are flying. Right? Wouldn't you agree that every pilot would have that information? Right? So, one is flying 120 miles per hour and the other one is flying at 150 miles per hour. One plane is 180 miles away the other plane is 225 miles away. There we go. We have our information. The question is, how fast is the distance between the planes changing? How fast is the distance between the planes changing well that's clearly dd dt because they want to know the change of distance in time and that's going to be on that diagonal line all right great now, we have all of the information, we have the question, we understand what they want to know, and we understand also, because it's a flight problem, why they want to know it, because they don't want this, these airplanes to, to collide. So the question now is, what geometry am I going to use to solve this problem? Triangle. What kind of triangle? Right triangle. Right triangle. Excellent. Now, we know a lot of formulas for right triangle. We know just six strict formulas for right triangle, right? You can write sine to cosine. Do we have any angles? No. So it's not going to be any trick. Yay. Okay. What other concepts do we know about triangles? Pythagorean theorem. Great. Is that going to be the one? Yeah. Yeah. Because Pythagorean theorem is doing what for us? Calculating, distance. Calculating distances, which is the length of the side of the triangle. Great. Guys, formulas you have for triangle are finite. Area, do we care about the area? No. Perimeter, maybe, but actually with Pythagorean theorem. And then you have <laughs> you have six trigonometric, right, that you could write, but we don't have any angles here, so we're not gonna worry about the trick. When you have an angle, then you worry about the trick. Awesome. So we are going to use Pythagorean theorem where you have your a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Now, you're not going to use a, b, and c because you already have your x, y, and d. So x squared plus y squared is equal to d squared. And um, now you take you take the derivative in respect to time. <coughs> when you take the derivative in respect to time, hello, implicit differentiation. What is the derivative of x squared? Yeah. Two, the change of x in Beautiful. dx dt. Change of x in time. Excellent. Plus, what's the derivative of y squared? dy over dt. So we always have to follow with the chain because t and y, not the same dimension. x and y, not the same dimension. How about on the other side? 2d. 2d. d d dt. Good. Now, now we can drop all of the 2s, right? Because if you divide both sides by, by 2, you can drop this. And we have x dx dt plus y dy dt is equal to d dd dt. Perfect. Now I want to know more. This is applied problem. I want to know what every single thing 
means in this equation in real life regarding the picture? What's x? x the distance of, of x from the airport of x. x airplane from the airport great so the, the top airport the top airplane the distance between airport and airplane that's x and we have that as 180 miles, 180 miles. great what's the x dt uh, 120 miles per hour what is that the rate that it's traveling at towards which is in our everyday talk is a rate a speed. speed of oh, the airplane yeah. <laughs> so the xdt is the speed of the x airplane and we also have that information given to us now common sense y is the distance of the y airplane to the airport which we have given as 225 thank you and we have dy dt, which is the speed of that, which is given as 150. <coughs> now, they are looking for dd dt, which is the speed at which the distance is decreasing. OK. I don't have capital D. It's all Pythagorean theorem. Great. You can calculate D using the formula x squared plus y squared because you know that x is something and y is something, so you can calculate D. Awesome. So you will have to play that game. When you have something missing, you will have to go and find it in one of the equations. So this problem is way spicier than the previous one because the previous one, everything was given. Just plug everything in, you're done. In this problem, you have to find D. So, to find D, uh, usually what I do is I say, oh, I have this, I have this, I have this, I have this. This is what they are looking for, so I'm going to label it as I have it. And then I say, oh, I don't have D. So, we find D. Uh, X is given as uh, 150? No, 180. So, 180 squared plus 225 squared is equal to d squared d is equal to the square root of and just punch this in the abacus and uh, get the numbers so 180 squared <coughs> plus no coughing 225 <laughs> squared you made you made me miss five so we get um, 8,300,025, and then when you take the square root of that number, you get 288.14. Uh, you should actually keep one decimal because your data did not have decimals. So in your calculation, you can provide one decimal. Please don't leave 16 decimals there. You can only provide an additional decimal when you do calculations that's that's the rule cool so now uh, I have now we also have to think a little bit when they say that something is decreasing you better have a negative number right so we are going to take a look at our airplanes and we're going to see that um, this airplane that it's going to the left right its speed is going to be a negative speed there right because it's moving to the left it should be going to the right with a positive speed so those are the, some of the things that uh, you have to be a little bit careful about uh, other than that we should be all uh, we should be all good um, we are going to get the negative number. Now, what you can do is actually you can, well, if, if you try, you'll see it will be wrong. So, <laughs> all right. So, what is X? Um, I lost my problem. Oh, there it is. So, X is um, one eighty, and then we are using negative one twenty because k 
Can anyone explain now why am I using negative 120? Because traveling to the origin. Because we are traveling towards the airport, exactly. This 120 is going to be decreasing the distance. So don't, have, don't, don't worry about moving to the left, moving to the right. Worry about if it's moving to what you said origin, which is reference point. So you are moving towards the airport, and because you are moving towards the airport, you are decreasing the distance as you are right, closing in, so it's negative. Then we have plus y, which is 225, and then we are multiplying with negative 150, because again, you are closing the distance, moving in. Equals to 288.1 times dd dt, which is what we are looking for. There we go. So now dd dt is going to be about negative 192 miles per hour. So the distance is decreasing by 192. See, the word decreasing, that's your minus there, right? So when you are losing volume, when you are losing area, when you are losing distance, all of those answers need to be negative. When you are gaining, they're positive. Maybe you want to write that in your notes. So, so I don't have to explain why is it minus 2 on the exam. <laughs> you have a wrong sign. So if stuff is decreasing, your answers are negative. If stuff is increasing, the answers are positive. So in this case, the distance is decreasing by 192 miles per hour. And because of the word decreasing, there is a minus there. If the stuff is decreasing, the answers are negative. And I say stuff, length, area, volume, I, whatever we are talking about, if it's decreasing, it's negative. Uh, could you have also, well, for this problem specifically, since they reached the airport at the same time, could you have calculated how long it would have taken them to get to the airport, and then got the value of D, and then divided D by the amount of time that it would take them to get to the Unfortunately, no, because these rates change as you travel. So the, the closer you are to the airport, the distance will be decreasing faster. So what we calculated here is a snapshot in time when these airplanes are this particular length of distance away. So, so that's, the, that's the deal. And the closer they are, the faster they... W would this be an important calculation? And do we have a Joe sitting somewhere computing these things? Uh, what you are going to see is the website which is called Flight Radar 24, uh, which uh, tracks all of the airplanes real real time. And um, that's that's Europe. Don't worry about it. Here we go. Can I can I kill this? Uh, that's United States. So, yeah, you would say, um, you would say a little bit busy. Yes, this is the real time tracking. So when my mom decides to visit, I actually wait to see that the airplane landed and then I go because it takes time for international right and bags and claim and all of that kind of stuff. So now what you can do is you can, you know, pick an airplane right here and it tells you where they started, where they when they're going to land and all that. And if you buy the if you buy the membership for the site, you can also log into the camera that overlooks the what they're flying over. Um, so you can see the, the but anyway. What if they fly over me on the day? What? what do you mean? Oh yeah. So over here, <laughs> right? You see all the traffic that is happening between uh, between U.S. and and uh, and Europe. 
right? So we see we see this one. Uh, let me go here so I can click this one. There we go. And uh, over over here, you you see the curved path they take, which in calculus three you're gonna learn that the shortest distance on the curved space is the curved line or the straight line. Now you're gonna learn those kind of things in calc three, not now. But yeah, it's a little bit busy, right? And uh, you have to untangle all of these planes. So what do we have? Um, Total airplanes tracked. This is not tracking Air Force One. It's not tracking any military airplanes or anything like that. 13,699 planes flying right now. Now, we did the calculation for two. Just look at it. You have to untangle this. You have, you have three airports. Right, there is JFK, there is Newark one and LaGuardia. Right, they're all one on top of another in New York. Look at JFK. Philadelphia Airport, Newark Airport. Check your friend's airport. Hmm? Your friend's airport? My friend. No, you, nah, that's, that's the little, these are the, the planes with 300 people plus, right? So, you have to track these planes. You have to know the distances between every one of them. Do you think that you do two at a time? This is where linear algebra kicks in for all of you computer science geeks. Because you have to take the calculation that we did now, right, and work that into the matrix and let the computer figure these things out because your control tower is not going to have their, you know, Joe writing the lines and measuring the distance and calling each plane, right? All of this is done automatically. The, the planes are transferring the data of how fast they're flying and where they are to the computer. The computer is doing this and gives the priority, knowing how much fuel, knowing how much, uh, when they need, right, giving the schedule. So these things are complicated. So next time when the flight is late, right? There is a reason why no one hates you. Yes. So when this goes automated, how do planes go missing, like that Malaysia flight? Oh, it just crashes into the ocean. It's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they, they, it's very simple. I mean... But could they not track it until it crashed? How could they not find it? Because the, tr the, tracker, because the tracker is in the plane when it sinks down. If it, See, you, you are used to... You know, seeing in movies how they nicely land on water and so on. Do you know what happens when something falls from 20,000 feet and, and hits the whole? It's like hitting on concrete. There's no difference, right? For 20,000 feet in the uncontrollable vertical dive, right? The plane is not a leaf. It doesn't fall like that, right? It falls like everything else. If they completely lose control, all you get when it hits the ground is confetti, right? So, so that that... Even if it survives the, the black box, it's going to be at the bottom of the ocean and unless you send transformers into retriever, I mean. Exactly. See, now we're talking. All right. Let's see another example. Let's talk about another example. So there was a, a little bit of mission control and then uh, some flavor of what you would be programming, right? Well, actually, it's already programmed. You would be fixing the, the software and updating and making it making it better. Let's see what else can we find. Do you find aliens? Aliens? Do you actually trust do one of those things? Yeah, I mean, someone has to do it. So obviously, there will be an interview. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's take one more example and then take a break. So what should we do next? Hmm. Uh, okay. Let's do this.
Would this be the good one? Let's see if this. I'm, I'm just looking for a, a random launch that would have the information that I would need. And I think this one is. This one is cool. Alright, so this is. Uh, a launch. And. Nine, eight. I wonder what's going to happen. All right, so you see how the, the rocket went out of the, the shot? Now, all right, here we go. So we know that this rocket is, is moving in um, miles per hour over here. So it's going already 200, and it's gonna go 250. And 300. We see that this rocket is always in the middle of the shot, right? Yeah, it's, uh, does this look like a human is um, taking this video? Heck no, right? Because you have to be zoomed in, right? And um, you have to match. Guys, it's going 550 already. So imagine a Joe shaking his finger, right? Trying to, to hold. Right? So it's already going 700 miles per hour, almost. There you go. The more you zoom in, every minor movement would actually bring it really out of focus. Just yeah. really still hands, man. <laughs> really still hands, yeah. Uh, and uh, as you can see, in the process of a launch, and you can't see because of the lights, so let's do this for a second. Uh, do you see that this is pretty much not even right? This is the whole, the whole flight thing, right? To go out of the look, it's better. Look at the speed over there. Right. Now imagine you getting a ticket at 80 miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> can't catch me. <laughs> so See you later, sad your speeds are, okay? So <laughs> it, it, it is going to go all the way up to 7,000 miles eventually, hopefully. So, um, so that's a rocket launch. And uh, you know what I want to do? I want to design now. I, I want to design a system. We, we can do it. I want to design a system that will get the camera moving so that the rocket is always in the middle of the shot. So there's gonna be a motor, servo motor, right? That there's gonna be a tripod, right? That you put on the ground. Then there is, a, there is some kind of mechanism here that will do this, right? You mount the camera right there. The rocket is gonna go right there and it's gonna go and follow and follow and follow and follow and follow. So you always want the rocket to be in the center of the shot. Now, to have a servo motor, you know, move the, the camera, to have this rocket in a shot all the time, guys, we're making money for SpaceX now or whatever. Um, you want to program the controller with mathematical function that will take the speed and the distance of the rocket and then to give us what we call the angular velocity because velocity in a circle is called angular velocity omega for those of you who took physics 
and you want to have that angular velocity omega, you want to have an equation for that one changing in time because obviously time passes, right, as, as the rocket moves. So let's design the system together. We are going to have a little bunker over here. I'm going to have a launch pad right there. We're going to put a rocket right here. This is going to be um, Space Nick. <laughs> Space Nick. There we go. And hold on, we need we need these obviously. It's a rocket, so it has to stand there, right? It's gonna be a, a booster over here. There we go. Perfect. All right. So now you have a, you have a rocket. And oh, I just realized I gotta bring this down a little bit because we need to launch it. So bring it down. All right. So now I am going to launch this one it's gonna go up now on the tripod over here I'm going to have that motor that will mount the high-tech camera as you can see and now the camera is going to track the rocket and as the as it goes up what I want to know is clearly there is an angle theta that I have to trace. What I am wondering about is what we call angular velocity omega, which is change in theta in time. That's what your angular velocity is. Change of angle in time. It covers the angle. Guys, look at my, my wrist. It covers the angle as the time passes, right? So that's what angular velocity omega is. I am going to set this, I don't know, 1,000 feet away. We are going to launch the rocket, and the rocket is going to be the height age away from the Earth because it just launches straight up, right? And as it launches straight up, it covers the vertical distance from this one. So now I'm going to ask you, what geometry am I using? Triangle. triangle. What kind of a triangle? A right triangle. A right triangle. Great. So I have a right triangle. And uh, what formula am I going to use for this right triangle, which has 1,000 over here, age over here, and theta over here? tangent you see that so this is the way you solve these problems I don't want you staring at the problem and saying I, I really don't know what the answer is of course you don't know what the answer is you have to figure out geometry and then particulars then the equation then to plug stuff in the answer is all the way down there right and you're not playing chess that you have to see five or ten steps ahead all you need to see is one step ahead Geometry, triangle, what kind of triangle, right triangle, what formula am I using? You are using tangent in this case because you have opposite, adjacent, and an angle. So write that tangent. Tangent theta is equal to age divided by 1000. Opposite over adjacent. This is basic trig formula. Now... What do I have to do here? Well, I can multiply a thousand here to get tangent theta equals h. Okay, no more fraction. I'm going to take derivative of this in time because that is the way for me to get to d theta dt because that's our angular velocity. Remember, angular velocity is the one that it's going to be programmed to help you rotate the camera so angular velocity is speed of the servo motor that that turns the camera so that's what it is 
When I take the derivative, you copy the constant 1000. What's the derivative of tangent? Very good. D theta dt, right? D theta dt, because you took the derivative of theta in respect to time, you have to follow with the chain. On the other side, derivative of h is? dh dt. Perfect. Now, you can move secant squared to the other side, and you will get d theta dt is equal to cosine squared theta divided by 1000 and then dh dt. Cool? Now, what's cosine theta? Well, go back to the triangle, figure out the hypotenuse because it's adjacent over hypotenuse. So what's our hypotenuse over here? It's a square root of h squared plus 1000 feet squared. So, uh, d theta dt is now our angular omega, which is what we were looking for. Cosine is going to be... Um, what is the cosine now? Cosine is op uh, adjacent over hypotenuse. So cosine is 1000 divided by the square root of h squared plus 1000 squared divided by 1000. And we still have dh dt. 1000 and 1000 will cancel. Square root and the square will cancel. And what we get is that omega is equal to 1 over square root of h squared plus 1000 squared dh dt. Welcome to being an engineer. Someone tells you, oh, I don't do any calculus as engineer. Well, yeah, of course, because you work sales. <laughs> this is what the engineer comes up with. Because now, engineer in a field is going to give this formula to the other engineer, who's a computer science one, who's going to work out the software for the controller, right? You're going to put the old mechanics, mechanics together. You have mechanical engineering, electrical engineering to wire the motors, computer science gigs to write the software for the controller, right? All of these things go together. Now. We know that omega is what we need because omega is the output that moves the servo motor where it goes fast or it goes slow. The difference between this motion and this motion is just omega. This one's faster than that one, right? What is h? What is h? Height of the rocket, right? And what's the h dt? The rate of the change of the height of the time. Which is called the uh, speed of the rocket. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's four seconds. Two times. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. so, so, guys, do you see that the angular velocity, which is our d theta dt that we need so that we can program controller, depends on the height of the rocket and the speed of the rocket? Hey, those two pieces of information we have, the rocket sends those, right? I'm this far away, moving at this speed, right? You had it in the corner, right? So now you have the model, and then you can compute, um, and as you, as you feed information, which is directly fed from the, from the information that the rocket gives off, you can uh, update real time omega, and um, that will, in, in fact, right, you, as you're updating this equation uh, every, every second, right, every split second, whatever it is, right, you keep upgrading this equation, it will be spitting out the values of theta, and that theta controls how fast the motor will spin, and the rocket will always be in the middle of the shot. And you don't have to have a Joe over there shaving, trying to figure out where the rocket is, and is it focused, and something like that.
So that's what the engineering looks like, right, when you want to design something using these things. So let's take a break. When we come back, we'll do some spicier examples.